Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new Ace in a Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing the Republic P47N15 Thunderbolt, an American fighter aircraft coming at a tier of 4 and a battle rating of 5.0. To provide you all with a brief historical overview as to this particular variant of the P47 Thunderbolt, we begin thus. With work beginning in September of 1944 on the P-47M variant, four P-47D27 airframes were used as prototypes and designated YP-47M. The second of these prototypes was to serve as the prototype for the P-47N variant. The intention of this variant was for it to act as a fighter escort for the B-29 Superfortress raids in the Pacific. To meet this role, the plane's internal fuel capacity was expanded by implementing a new, larger wing design incorporated two 50 gallon fuel tanks. This increased the internal fuel capacity of the plane to 1146 gallons, giving it a maximum range with external fuel tanks included of 2000 miles or 3200 kilometers. Otherwise the design was centered around a P47D airframe with the following alterations. An enlarged dorsal fin, strengthened landing gear, clipped wing tips to increase the plane's roll rate, and it was powered by the Pratt & Whitney R2800 77C double wasp radial engine, which when combined with the General Electric CH5 turbo supercharger provides a 2800 horsepower output. However with all these modifications the P47N was a very heavy aircraft. Its empty mass was 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms and 20,700 pounds or 9,400 kilograms at full load. This max mass value includes the 10 high velocity aircraft rockets or HVAR rockets that the plane could mount under wing, with 5 to each wing. Despite her mass however, the P-47N could reach a top speed of 467 miles per hour or 751 kilometers an hour. It could operate up to an altitude ceiling of 43,000 feet, 13,100 meters, and possessed a climb rate of approximately 3,000 feet per minute or 15.2 meters per second. The variant entered production in December of 1944, with a total of 1,816 aircraft being built. Armed with the standard 8 12.7mm M2 Browning machine gun setup, the P-47N primarily saw service in the Pacific in its intended escort role. The Dash 15 designation of the aircraft on screen today simply denotes its production block. The final production block, the P-47N25, was to conclude in October of 1945 just after the conclusion of the Second World War, and with the conclusion of the Second World War came the end of the P-47's role in combat service. And with our historical overview concluded today, let us take a look at how the P-47N15 handles in War Thunder's arcade mode. Today's gameplay takes place on the frontline map for Tills. For our setup we are using the following. Tracers for our 12.7mm machine guns, reasoning being that our overall approach to every engagement will be that a single pass should do the job. Therefore we want rounds that will do a good amount of damage upon impact and at the same time have a high chance of setting our foes on fire to cause them to burn to death. The tracers consisting solely of armour piercing sentry tracer rounds enable this. And continuing through with this theme we are using a 600m gun convergence as we want to use boom and zoom passes and always keep our foes at longer distances to avoid embroiling ourselves in a turn fight or indeed getting into a situation where our opponent may have an equal opportunity to take us down. And as for our fuel load, we're using a 45 minute fuel load to make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity, and this is the lowest amount of fuel available to this aircraft's loadout. We begin our review of the P-47M15 then by discussing its climb rate. The climb rate of this aircraft when looked at amongst its competition at its battery rating and tier is average at best able to match up to the likes of the Focke Fon 90 A8, but nowhere near the likes of the Focke Fon 90 D9 or the Messerschmitt Y9 G2 for comparison. And as you go into higher battle rating matches, up to your maximum limit of 6.0 in this aircraft in the standard match, you'll find that the likes of the Messerschmitt Y9 K4 and the LA9 will clearly outclimb you by a large margin, by 1000 meters in a given climb period usually. But, when looked at as an independent, the P47 N15's climb rate is nothing to laugh at. When given time and space this aircraft can gain a lot of altitude in a single climb, and we're seeing that here. We're buying ourselves time by reversing our directionality away from a Focke Fon 90 A5 U2 climbing towards us, or at least towards the centre of the map, and we're now heading towards 5000 meters plus. 
Therefore, this is a plane that prefers subtlety in its climb rather than outright aggression, compared to a number of planes that you can fly at the same battle rating, which when climbing towards their foes will exert a dominance over them and perhaps intimidate them from climbing any further. The P-47N is not one of those aircraft in my experience. As well as tracking the Focke for 90 at this point, we are also tracking a B-25J-20 Mitchell, who is gradually making their way over towards our territory, potentially dropping bombs, but also perhaps going for the Sterling flying underneath us. We want to help try and protect the Sterling. Now we know we have left it too late to turn and engage the B-25 before they get to our ally, even with our great dive speed, which we are going to show an example of. But we can catch the B-25 on the return leg of their journey, and we will catch them right in the sweet spot of their returning turn. The Sterling gets set on fire temporarily and the B-25 goes into the turn. We catch them at the halfway point here and instantly take out their tail controls. We continue to open fire and rip apart both wings, setting them both on fire. And that plane is going to burn to death gradually for our first kill. Our tracer belt is really coming in handy from the start. We continue to look at the Focke for 90 A5U2 from earlier and the P-63 that's coming in as well. They're both going for our allied B-25 below us. We're just watching at the moment as we level our plane out just shy of 6,000 metres altitude. The B-25 has been eliminated by the enemy Focke and now they're coming up into the zoom portion of their boom and zoom pass. We're going to make sure they cannot go on any further. We make sure the P-63 is not coming around for a head-on and we come down the Focke for 90 who in their pronounced turn, in a rather laboured one due to the 20mm cannon under their wings, means we can cut them apart for our second kill by setting them on fire, taking out their tail control, 2 out of 2 on that regard and they'll burn to death. Now we have a situation. We have a P-51D5 off to R6. They've just come out of an engagement with our Sterling from earlier, and their ally in the P-51D5 by another one is heading down towards lower altitude, but this Mustang has us in their sights. Fortunately for us, we're already pulling distance. That is because the p 47 m 15 when coming out of boom and zoom passes, so long as you do not make any exaggerated manoeuvres, can really hold its speed. And when it goes to altitude, high altitudes in excess of 5,000 metres, or even in the case here, just over 4,500 metres, this plane can build up a lot of speed over time and really frustrate its foes in being very difficult to catch. As we gradually pull the distance on the P-51D, we've brought ourselves enough distance already to turn towards an Allison engine P-51, which is climbing up towards our allied Messerschmitt Wire 9. So if we continue in this approach using a little bit of war emergency power just to make sure we have enough speed, but we do not essentially need it, then we'll be able to catch the Allison Engine P-51 with the Merlin Engine P-51 on R6, and we can pick up a free kill. Let's do it. So as we continue to pursue the P-51 Allison Engine 1, we gain quite a bit of ground very quickly, and our speed is maintained at roughly 638 km an hour, decreasing only gradually now. And as you go to altitudes in excess of 6,000 meters, you'll be able to keep this speed even more easily. We come up right on the 6 of the P-51 here, who has only realised we're there at the last minute, and we cut them apart for our third kill, ripping off their right-hand wing. The P-51 on our 6, the D-5, is now catching us because of the manoeuvre we've made. But we're going into a gradual dive here just to build up a little bit more speed. It is not going to be enough to allow us to outrun the Mustang on our 6, because we spent a lot of energy in climbing up towards the Allison Engine P-51 but enough to exaggerate this engagement and pull the enemy away from friendly territory, i.e. their friendly territory, and turn this into a one versus one. So, we go for the turn fight, and our intention is not to win by bringing our opponent down, but instead force them to overshoot and dive away from the threat of our 850 caliber machine guns. They're very menacing. We're going to a set of scissors here using our roll rate to conduct it. After two cuts, the P-51's already overshot. We lose a lot more energy in manoeuvres, tight manoeuvres on turns, and indeed sharp rolls, than the likes of the P-51, and in general we bleed a lot of energy in our manoeuvres compared to our opponents at our batter rated and tier. We could have potentially gone for the kill on the third crossover, how that would have put us in a very difficult position to escape from as we would have been nosed down and the P-51 could have then have rolled out over top of us and gone into a split S to come down on us, so instead we took the safer approach and forced the P-51 to sit in front of us, albeit of our sluggish rudder holding us back from getting the kill shot. But the Mustang has dived away to live another day, and we continue to propagate up at high altitude, and we go for a reload. Now reloads are not essential after every engagement, simply because you have 3,400 rounds, you have a lot of ammunition available. But when you have the space to do so, reloads are quick and quite cheap, so do not be afraid to take them. The P-51 is just lingering 2.5km below us, and we decide to ignore them, they're not a threat. Instead, we have a B-17 that we need to engage, or at least make them turn. 
But unfortunately the B-17 has clocked on to the fact that if they just turn their 6 towards us we're going to be flying into a hail of 50 caliber machine gun turrets and we really do not want to press our durability even though it is quite high as we'll see a little bit later. So instead let us talk about the controllability of this aircraft. The best control surface of the P-47M15 is indeed its ailerons by its roll rate being one of the highest at its battery rate and tier comparable to the likes of the Focke 490D9. The roll rate only locks up roughly 10% of the way when you hit 600 km an hour, with the lockup completing by 700 km an hour. The elevator is heavy, and as a result, when coming out of a high speed dive at ground level, you need to be careful to anticipate coming out of the dive sooner than you would another aircraft. Reason being, you have a high chance of playing yourself into the ground, but there is no official lockup on the elevator control surface as we set the PBJ on fire take out their tail control as well, and unfortunately we're going to fluff our pass on the enemy thunderbolt here because we open fire at too close a range, while 600 meter gun convergence, sorry, 600 meter gun convergence compromising our shots. Meanwhile, with regards to the rudder, this is the weakest of your control surfaces, it is sluggish in general, and when you hit 450 km an hour, it starts to experience a 50% lock up, maximising by the time you hit 550 km an hour. And as we're going to see here against the Focke 490 A8, this is going to cost us a clean kill. So the Focke 490 A8 is going to climb towards us, and we are going to exaggerate this engagement by taking it into the vertical and conducting a set of vertical spirals, by like ours and theirs. We cut over the top and use all three of our control surfaces here to make sure the A8 can never get a clean shot. They come extremely close, but they never graze our aircraft. The A8 is now beginning to stall out, and we are as well. Our stall speed being 150 km an hour, but our stall effects coming into play at roughly 230 km an hour. Our rudder takes a long time to bring us around in the hammerhead, and unfortunately that means by the time we do come around, the Fockles already built up enough speed by going out of their stall to be able to avoid a good portion of our shots. And as we get in close, we are playing against our gun convergence as mentioned earlier. Now we have a Messerschmitt 19 F1R6, we take a vertical spiral, but they are going to hit us with so much energy here, and indeed they do with their 20mm cannon, but they eventually overshoot. We're dead surely folks, I mean look at our controls. The tail control is wrecked. But no, it's not over. The Mesh Smith Wire 9 as they come around in a laboured turn trying to cut as much speed as possible because we bled out all our energy in that vertical spiral and we stalled out. Gets taken out by our friendly Mesh Smith Wire 9 G2. And our tail control is still working perfectly, both the rudder and the elevator. That's because the durability of the P-47 M15 is one of the best of its fighters at its battery rate and tier. Albeit that Henschel 129B2 took a lot of shots there, but again we did open fire well within our gun convergence, i.e. below distances of 600 meters, hence why they got away. But no, the durability of the P-47 M15 is very good, and indeed this plane is not going to easily catch on fire. I've personally found the only time this plane catches on fire is when the engine takes a significant amount of damage. If a sustained amount of fire is put on the engine, this plane will burst into flames at that point, which is why you want to avoid chasing enemy bombers tail on, because they will aim for the engine and try to set it on fire. So instead now having levelled out at 3,677 metres altitude approximately, we continue on our endeavours. We notice an enemy LA-7 occupying the high altitude regions of the sky, contesting our friendly LA-7. Now as the two go head to head and pass each other, our friendly LA-7 wants nothing of it meaning that the enemy LA-7 is now going to turn their attention towards us. We anticipate this early, and we go to frustrate them, much like we did with the P-51D Mustang from earlier. But with the LA-7 having the altitude advantage here, and indeed the speed advantage as we made our turn away from them, we decide just to go into a gentle dive and pull the LA-7 away from the centre of the map. Now the logic here is, with the distance we already have on the LA-7, if needs be and they continue this pursuit and we hit the map border, we will split us and head back towards our allies. We have the ability to build up enough speed in the dive to do so. We have nothing to fear, especially with that top speed in the dive of 961 km an hour. But eventually the LA-7 gets the message, you follow us, you're going to become frustrated and we will just waste your time. So they break off instead and look for something else to shoot at, giving us the time and space to build up our altitude. Now let's just talk about the altitude performance of the P-47M15. Where does this plane perform best in terms of altitude, as we pursue the LA-7, who has now clocked onto one of our allies over in the southern side of the map, our friendly Spitfire who is now on screen. Below 3,500 metres altitude, the P-47M15 feels very difficult to handle. Not just in terms of its engine performance, which feels rather lacklustre, 
but also in terms of the controllability. The control surfaces just feel as though they've got this extra bit of mass on them which really needs to go away. And the only way you're going to get rid of that heaviness of the controls is by heading to altitudes in excess of 5,000 metres. There's a transitional stage at 3,500 metres to 5,000 metres, but as soon as you get within the altitude region of 5,000 to 10,000 metres, this plane is at your command. The engine performs very nicely, as we saw earlier against the P51 D5 Mustang, being able to stretch out the engagement as much as possible, and indeed, not just against P51 D5s, you can do this against Focke 490 D9s, Spitfire LF Mark 9s, the majority of your opposition. You can stretch out those engagements, and you can take your opponents to extreme altitudes, whereby their performance will falter. The majority faltering at 7,500 metres, meanwhile you only begin to actually falter and experience the effects of high altitude performance at 10,500 metres. And with your service ceiling going all the way up to 13,000 metres plus, as seen in the historical overview, you've got nothing to worry about. Only the likes of the TA-152H1, which you'll rarely see, will be able to compete. We come up here on the B-25J from below, putting a lot of shots into the J-20, setting them on fire, and we continue to open fire our 850 caliber machine guns, shredding them for what is our fourth kill. A bit of overkill, we could have just let them burn to death, but we love shredding things with 50 caliber machine guns, and whilst they lack the one-shot potency of a 20mm high explosive shell, with sustained fire and accurate fire, they will cut apart foes as if they're made of Swiss cheese. We level out here at 5,480 metres altitude approximately, and continue our way across the map. Now if we'd not taken all the damage we did from earlier from that Messerschmitt 19 f one although we did play to the durability of this aircraft, we'd happily gun contest the PBJ and the P61, chasing down our friendly Dornier 217 up at altitude on the other side of the map. But we do not want to press our luck, so at this point we're going to play safe. Pardon me. We'll take on threats at closer ranges at similar altitudes to us, if not slightly below us. A Dornier 217E appears. We decide as they're going to level bomb to take them on. We expect if we go over the top of them or try to dive towards them, they will go for the head on with their 20mm cannon. It's what we want, and here we go. Reason being, at any point we can just use our elevator to snap over the top of them, and as soon as we notice them put their nose down, we'll split S. Because we have enough speed here to continue the engagement, the ideal engagement speed for the P47M15 is any speed between 400 and 600 km an hour. Now I say that knowing that the rudder is going to lock up at 450 km an hour, but the rudder is not too important in this aircraft, you're performing manoeuvres in a straight line, and any time you need to turn, you're using your ailerons predominantly, rather than the rudder to commit to the turn. Therefore, this plane performs well on that threshold, and with the minor roll rate lockup that starts at 600 km an hour, you want your roll rate to be at its maximum. Of course, in boom and zoom passes and high speed pursuits in those dives, you will need to go to extreme speeds to keep up. But of course you can do so with the minimal compromise on your roll rate, and no compromise whatsoever on your elevator. Now the P-38G1 we wanted to pursue crashes into the wreck of the Typhoon our team they took out, and we zoom climb once again. The P-61 we were talking about from earlier makes their presence known in the centre of the map at high altitude, and we'll just watch them for the time being. They are no threat, they do not seem to have clocked on to our climbing presence. Instead, they appear to be going for their own boom and zoom passes over our allies coming from spawn. So we level out at 5,200 metres, dropping slightly just to build up a little bit more speed, and we notice the B-17s appeared, and an IL-4 has also appeared behind them. Now we would go for the B-17 at this point, but we are fearful that our luck is going to run out. So instead, we clock onto the F-4U Corsair potentially climbing up towards us, we always need to keep it checked, and then we look towards the IL-4. The Corsair at first begins to climb towards us and we go for the split S, but soon after it actually appears as though they were just making a climbing turn, either their own little hammerhead in a way, or a stall turn, so we carry our way on towards the IL-4, taking out a plane, indeed a bomber, which does have quite a noticeable bomb load, and one that could change the course of the game. So we break up here, going for the easier target of the two, theoretically, and we'll very quickly rip them apart of our 50 calibers once again, and this means that the P-47M15 can act as an adequate bomber interceptor from time to time, even against the more durable likes of the Year 2 the B-17 and the G5N1. Unfortunately we've had the easier examples today if you will, and the easier targets to take out. Having levelled out at 5600 metres altitude, we will now pursue the B-17 towards the end of the game. If they continue to become a threat and taking out our airfield, then we'll just try and knock them out when they make their turn for their subsequent ones, otherwise we'll just wait up here for the rest of the match to end. As we can see, very shortly, I believe, the ground targets on the enemy team will be eliminated, and our need to bring down the B-17 is no more, so we'll just stay alive to the rest of the day. 
We go into a split test once more, just showing the ability for this aircraft to go into a split test quite rapidly. Look towards a B-17 coming out of spawn on the enemy team, we'll never get there in time. And we deploy our aerobatic smoke and celebrate in style, having picked up a good number of kills in our rather adverse circumstances due to the damage we have taken. And with the game over, it is time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. With our 6 kills and 2 assists, we're able to pick up 34,075 silver lines and 3,558 research points. To defeat the P-47M15 in a given matchup then, I can recommend one of three approaches. The first is to engage it in a standard turn fight, reasoning being this plane is a lot less manoeuvrable than the majority of its battle rating opposition, and therefore, if you do not outturn it directly, you'll very quickly find after a number of manoeuvres, the P-47N will bleed out a large amount of its energy and be a sitting duck for you. Although be aware, when on its 6, you may actually overshoot because the P-47N can bleed so much energy in a single manoeuvre. Carrying on from this, the second approach would be to lure the P-47N into a spiral climb when it is on your 6, especially below 3,500 metres where its overall performance is lacklustre compared to what it prefers above 5,000 metres. You will have the control ability based on your superior manoeuvrability to cause the P-47N to eventually stall out, and with their laboured rudder, they will take a lot of time to hammerhead around and go back into a return dive. Meanwhile, with your superior rudder, you'll be able to come about and shred the Thunderbolt before it can get away. The third and final approach, a hesitant one, is to engage it in a head-on pass, as its 50 caliber machine guns are mounted in the wings. Although do be aware the P-47N can be quite evasive in a head-on, thanks to the fact that even with your nose-mounted 20mm cannon, in the recommended case, this plane can snap roll quite nastily, whereby its high roll rate and stiff rudder will give it an exaggerated snap roll circle, by comparison with the Focal 490 D9, which has a tight roll circle in the snap roll, thanks to its high rudder response and high roll rate, meaning that the snap roll of the P-47M15 can be difficult to predict. In conclusion, the P-47M15 Thunderbolt is a high altitude fighter suited for the roles of bomber interception and bomber escort, although it takes time and space for this plane to be able to obtain the altitude to perform these roles, and that is where this plane gets caught out quite easily. Nonetheless, once up at altitude and up to speed, this can be one frustrating opponent, because when you try to chase it down, it will outrun you from the outset. Alternatively, when you begin to catch it, the P-47N only needs to go into a gentle dive to once again start to outrun you. And when you invite it to turn fight with you, its weakest area of performance, the P-47M pilot can use their higher roll rate to force you to overshoot and fall right onto the path of their 850 caliber machine guns. Alternatively, they will just split us away and dive away to live to fight another day. Therefore, this battered old bird, whilst a difficult one to sell to the average pilot, if given the chance, can still serve you and its team rather well. And so I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies!